Hi, everyone. I'm Diane Summers, president of the American Rose Society, and I'm glad to be here today with Paul Zimmerman and Jackson and Perkins on another webinar on rose gardening tips. I'm sure you're going to enjoy today's webinar as we talk about companion plants for roses. You know, many of us know how to grow rose. That's why we're members of the American Rose Society. But how do we take that rose and integrate it into our garden landscape and have a beautiful landscape that includes roses? We're so fortunate to have Paul here today. And Paul is going to help us to on those concepts related to companion planting with roses. We're not gonna talk about specific plants per se, because we know we have people from all over the country here and you're in many different planting zones. But I know that Paul will give us the path so that we can all plan to have beautiful gardens. Paul? Hi, Diane, how you doing? I'm doing well. So Greg, great to have you here with us today. Oh, it's always fun to be here. You know, to talk about roses and plants. I mean, how good of a day can that possibly even be? Absolutely. So this is great. So I appreciate you all coming on board and asking me to do this. Um, you know, as, as people who know me a little bit, roses and companion plants and roses and perennials have always been something that I've talked a lot about. You know, I always say a rose is nothing more than a flowering shrub, and that's how you use it in the landscape. Um, I want to caveat this a little bit before we get started, saying that this is roses and companion plants. And as I say when I do my other talks, this is simply a way of growing roses. It's not the way of growing roses. So if you have folks who grow roses by themselves in the garden on their own, exhibitors, for example, would do that. And there are beautiful gardens, I think of like the Huntington and Roseray de Laie in France that have beautiful gardens with nothing but roses. That's okay too. There's no right or wrong here. But if you want to try using some companion plants in your garden, there are a couple of little tips I'm going to give you on the application of how to do it. Not what to do, but how to do it, what to think about as we move through it. So if we're going to get rolling right now, so why companion plants? I got a couple of different reasons for you. One, I think they add beauty to a garden. And for me particularly, I live in the upstate of South Carolina, zone seven. We get hot and humid summers. My roses kind of shut down a little bit during the summertime. So I love to add companion plants that bloom in the summer. Something like rutabecchia, black-eyed Susan, echinacea, agastache. That's my summer color while the roses are kind of sleeping a little bit. That's the reason I love to do it. Um, and diverse planting, a little sideline of this, maybe people don't know this, beneficial insects, creating a host environment for beneficial insects. If you want to go to Jackson Perkins, we actually have a full video on what that means, but that's part of the three triads to bring beneficial insects into your garden, food, water, shelter. The perennials are food. That's an important part as well. One little tip that I found out recently from our good friend, Diane, you know, Dr. Mark Windham, University Thank of Tennessee, you. now now retired actually, a man of leisure. Um, but uh, Mark had told me what they call, you can use perennials, what are called barrier plants against rose rosette disease. What does he mean by that? Rose rosette disease, as you all know, is transferred only by a very certain mite. And that mite is windborne. It cannot fly at all. That's number one. Number two, that mite only lives on roses. I'm going to repeat that. That mite only lives on roses. That's a key. So if you have a rose here and a rose here and the mite is here and it gets blown by the wind over towards the rose over here, if it lands on the rose, this rose could get rose rosette disease. If there's a barrier plant like a perennial or something like that or an evergreen in the middle of it, it lands on that plant and because it's not a rose, it dies. So there's another good reason for that. So it's called barrier plants is how Mark basically describes those. So those are a couple of different reasons. Beauty to the garden, um, they can bloom during the heat of summer, Diverse planting means more beneficial insects and a barrier plant for the mite that spreads RRD. So those are a couple of reasons why I'm sort of making the case why I want you to use like companion plants in your roses. So Diane, let's pop over to the next slide. So criteria, what are the criteria for starting to select the plants? We're starting to get that process now of building your garden as we move through. You want perennials that like sun. Why? Roses like full sun. Makes sense. You know, if you can't put a shade plant, a hosta in with roses, it's going to burn. So obviously select your perennials for full sun. Part of the criteria of plant selection is always, what's its job? What am I going to use it for? That's a very good thing. Now, you've got two goals in mind when you're working and starting to build your garden or your perennials and your roses in your garden here, your companion plant garden. One is contrast. 
What do I mean by contrast? Contrast could be color, possibly, maybe, not so much. The flowers are actually not as important as you think. Contrast is shape. Shape of the flower, shape of the plant, shape also down to growth habits. So, for example, most roses, the bushes are kind of round, correct? If you look at the photograph on the left, you see roses in there. This is my garden in uh, the upstate of South Carolina. Um, you see bronze fennel in there. That's a contrast in texture, okay? So I've got a feathery foliage of a bronze fennel. Artemisia comes to mind for something like that as well. Powers Castle is a variety that comes to mind. That's a texture shape as well. There's a contrast right there. You also see in there an upright penstemon. That particular variety is Huskers Red. That's an upright growth habit, spiky flowers, contrast to the rounded type shape of the roses. So think contrast in texture, contrast in shape, contrast in growth habit, all of those basic contrasts that you can come up with, okay? Repetition, that's number two. Now, I know I'm talking to rose folks because this is the American Rose Society, American Rose Society, easy for you to say. Now, I also know that you guys are just like I am, okay? You say, oh, I'm going to go out and plant my garden. I'm going to buy this rose and that rose. I'm going to put this color over here and that color over there. And that's all really good until next year's catalog comes out. And then your plans are blown to heck. Because you say, now I'm going to buy this rose and that rose. You have no place to put them. You end up like me, anywhere between 250, 300 roses. You know, if I have two of the same variety, that's pretty rare. I don't know where they're going to go color-wise. Nice little key, repetition. Look at the photograph on the right. You see the pink flower, that's dianthus, okay? You see it down again a little bit further down on the border, that's the same dianthus. You see lamb's ears, that's the very rough foliage, the broad, kind of like broad foliage, gray silvery color that you've got there. I take these companion plants and I repeat them through my garden constantly. That's the thread that sort of ties the garden together as I'm moving through that garden. So that's the repetition, what I mean by repetition. You know, don't be tempted to go out and get you know, a hundred different perennials to put in with a hundred different roses. That's going to be a very visually busy garden. So it's real important repetition. So again, contrast, that's your goal that you're looking after. Contrast of shape, color, texture, all of those kind of things, because roses are fairly consistent in the, in the leaf shape and things like that. You want the contrast. So we'll actually have a way to illustrate that a little bit further. Repetition of the perennials ties the garden together as we all go collecting roses every single year when those new catalogs come out. So those are a couple things to take important. So Diane, any questions? Anything you think that I need to elaborate on a little further? Uh, I have to I have to say that I didn't know you were as crazy as a rose person as I am, right? And you're absolutely right. We're trying to find more spaces for those roses in our garden every year. And I yeah. really like your comments around repetition and contrast. And you know, that actually reminds me of all of us that do flower and rose arrangements because those are some of the same concepts. Yeah, it, it, actually you're right, right. And I'm glad you brought that up because you know, American Rose Society does great arrangement classes and arrangement judging and things like that. So it's the very kind of very similar kind of things that you're working at, only now you're doing it outdoors and perhaps a larger scale. But yeah, that repetition for us crazy rose folks um, who collect <laughs> everything that comes down the pike. It's a great, it's it's almost like, think of the perennials as the picture frame around your garden. And the more harmonious that picture frame is, the more chaos you can have in between. I almost say it's like a picture frame around a Picasso painting. All kinds of stuff going on in the middle, but then you've got that nice steadiness that sort of ties it all together. And that's where these perennials can really, really help. So. I agree. They can really tie it together. I was actually thinking of, of a painting and the creation of a painting as we look at your photos here. So let's go on. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a couple things here into account as we begin building this. So we already have contrast. We have repeating. We have that color. That's important. You want colors to be harmonious. We're going to look at a color wheel in just a little bit. That'll kind of explain it a little bit more. Shape of the plant. That's the kind of thing I just talked about. There's where our contrast comes in. Again, roses. And I know there's exceptions, but by and large, they have a rounded shape, upright, a hybrid tea, maybe a little more upright. Floor bundle a little more round. Some of the shrubby or the old garden roses, David Austin roses, maybe a little bit more leggy, but there's some consistency to how the basic shapes are. So we're looking at that. Texture, just talked about that as well. The contrast of the texture and the foliage is very, very important. A garden is less about its flowers than it is sometimes about its foliage, and that's very important to think about. Bloom size, believe it or not, that's a contrast. If you grow all hybrid teas and floor abundance, you're getting a pretty similar size. But look at the photographs. There's a hybrid tea, Bellaroma on the left. You've got happy, chappy ground cover. That's a smaller bloom, a single flower bloom. 
wedding dress ground cover, also a smaller bloom, but that's also a flower that is more fully petaled. Then you've got Cinnamon Girl, which is a miniature that looks like a Arbor Tea, but a smaller bloom. All of that is contrast. Well, so those are the kind of things that we're looking to sort of begin to build basically this garden as we move through it. So let's take a look at color. This is one that throws people off a lot. And um, I found this in uh, Proven Winners, and you can see the link to the article down below there. This is one of the best articles on color and the color wheel that I ever found. And this is a really nice way to sort of begin to understand how colors work and don't work together, because they, how they don't work together is just as important. So you've got basically three ways of looking at color. On your left, the very first one is what's called analogous, analogous colors, pardon me. Oof. Um, so those are basically colors that are next to each other. So on the color wheel, red goes with orange, orange goes with yellow, green and yellow, green and blue, blue and violet, violet and red. They're next to each other. So also, but violet will go with blue and with red. Now you've got three colors in the play. So you're working with colors next to each other on the color wheel. Then you get into the color triad scheme. This gets a little more complicated. As you can see, you're basically moving across and over. So you've got orange, violet, and green going together here. That means red, yellow, and blue would go together, and you can continue to sort of work your way around. So that's a nice way to begin seeing, okay, these colors are going to work together. Obviously, there's nuances in there. You know, red has nuances. Um, and then the last is complementary colors. Those are the, the ones that are opposite each other on the color wheel. So orange and blue, if anyone's ever had an orange colored or a hot colored garden and thrown in blue colors, they just make those oranges and those yellows pop like crazy. So... This is a really just a simple, basic way to just begin looking at colors. Um, if you're not sure where to start, go with blue. You can see in the photos here of different colored roses Jackson Perkins offers, paired with different perennials we offer as well in the purple to blue range. Purple, blue, roses, it's a home run every single time. So, Diane, I'm going to pause here again and let you jump in because you might mm -hmm. have some questions or some thoughts and some other things we need to cover about the color wheel. Well, I'm curious that when you're planting a garden, do you stick to one theme, either use analogous colors or the triad, or is it sections within your garden? Um, how, do you, how do you do that? That is a fabulous question. Um, I'm going to answer it two ways here. When it's in my garden, all bets are off, um, because it's just whatever road shows up is going to find a hole. But if I'm designing a garden for someone, yes, I am going to try to use probably analogous and complementary more than anything else. Um, and the other thing to do is what you just touched upon right then and there, which is different sections of your garden. Mm -hmm. So let's say you've got maybe two or three gardens in your garden space. So it's not just one border. You've got a garden here, a garden here, and a garden here. Well, why not have a cool colored garden, a warm colored garden, and then maybe even like a white garden, like they have a Sissinghurst or something like that. But you want to theme those gardens together. So if you're doing a warm colored garden, for example, and if you want to go with a color triad, for example, let's say you want to do red, the color triad is the one in the middle. Well, you could do red, yellow, and violet, and there's your hot border. So that's the kind of thing you can look at it with that. You know, and then if you want to do a nagalus, well, then you, that could be, um, you know, violet, blue, and green can be your cool colored border. Um, the other thing that you can do, and a very old trick in English, traditional English garden design, Gertrude Jekyll was the one who kind of pioneered this. If you have a long border, she had cool colors on the edges, and as it came together, the colors got hotter and warmer and warmer, and then she had the real warm colors in the middle. But then you can also know if you need to go from blue to orange, okay, you can see what colors are going to move, move me in through that by kind of using this color wheel. And another great little tip, if you're not sure how to separate two colors, white is the great neutralizer in colors. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I have to ask, cold colors? Warm colors, I'm not sure I understand. So cool colors are colors like, like blues and greens and whites and violets and purples and things like that. There, there's, um, there are, yeah, I know, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a great thing. Maybe you think of cool as in like cool, like, you know, um, cool, cool, I don't know, like ice is cool. It's, it's kind of a blue. It's, it's, it's kind of a cool color like that. When I think of, man, maybe the term is not warm colors. I think the only you, uh, term I could use is hot colors. Um, okay. You know, you think of yellow and red and, and orange as hot colors, you know, very bright. Or maybe bright and, and, and more subdued colors might be the, the other ways to look at it. Or even bright and hot and pastel might be the other ways to look at it. Does that help a little bit? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. That's good. My pleasure. All right. Let's move on. 
All right. So, Shape, we talked about this a little bit already. We've touched a little bit, so we're not going to go very much detail onto this. Um, pardon me as I scroll up my script. Um, so, contrasting Shape, this is a very simple one in the lower left-hand corner. It's a foxglove and a floribunda rose. It's uh, The rose is Alfred Sisley. Um, and you can just see the foxglove is upright, the rose is round. Now I've got a, now just even in my hands, you can see I've got a contrast going on. So that already begins to make the garden interesting. Now there's movement in the garden as you move through it. Um, in the, the photograph to the right, um, that is again our farm, you see all kinds, you know, you can kind of see where the roses are in there, but you've got the low and spreading in the middle, that's the dianthus, that's the pink in the middle. And you also see that on the dianthus, I've got gray foliage. Gray is a great color contrast with roses, gray foliage. That's why lavender and roses is a very classic pairing. Think about that. You can also see in the back, kind of uh, maybe to the right and just slightly behind the dianthus, there's some blue balls there or blue globes. That's um, alliums is what those are. Again, a contrast I've got going on there and shape and growth habit. The allium flower is very airy. I can see through it. It's almost like a translucent kind of look, which is different than a rose flower, which is not translucent in any way. To the right of dianthus, I've got my lamb's ears going on right there. So again, that's my repeating of my lamb's ears, but that's sort of a heavy gray leaf, again, that gray silver foliage, that heavy foliage that contrasts against the roses, and I feel really pops them off. That's James L. Austin behind it. You can tell I'm a rose geek, Diane, because I'm just naming the roses without even to go look them up. <laughs> they're, like, they're like our children, aren't they? Um, and then to yeah. the left of dianthus, which is the three blobs of green that haven't started to flower yet, those are veronicas, also kind of a spiky flower as well. And nice that it looks like you've got those uh, climbing roses at the back of your garden. Yeah, I do. I've got, uh, in this case, I've got some uh, tree roses back there, some climbing roses. And that's a very great point that you bring up, Diane, because one of the things that you always want to do when you're looking straight at a border like this is you want like low plants in the front, then in the middle slightly higher, in the back even higher still. And that's where climbing roses are a gem in the garden. Um, you know, because they, they add their, that backdrop layer that they've got. If you think about pillaring a rose, now you've got vertical interest going on as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that you can really use the roses to layer. And, and I always say, you know, people ask me, you know, why roses in the garden? And one of the things I like to talk about is that, think about this for just a moment, okay? You're a gardener, and you have to pick out plants for your garden. You've got a variety, a class of plants, the rose, okay? that grows anything from a foot high in miniatures, round cover spreading roses, things like that. Then you get into the floor abunders or the mini floors, two to three feet, maybe four feet. Hybrid teas grant the floors up to five to six, shrubs that spread out. Then you've got climbers that go eight feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, ramblers that can go 30, 40 feet. It comes in every color of the rainbow but blue, and the vast majority will bloom from spring to summer. Think about that. That's an amazing palette of plants that the roses offers us from a landscape design standpoint. Absolutely. And I like to think about uh, putting more color in my garden lately. So I've been really focused on those floribundas and the shrub roses that are going to have a lot more bloom to them and a faster repeat bloom than perhaps a hybrid tea might. Although I do have a lot of hybrid teas as well. Yeah, I do too. I've got hybrid teas in my garden. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, I tend to go mid border, back of border, where I can put some low growing perennials or other plants in front of them. You know, a lot of the hybrid teas are well foliated, but the, the, the shape is fairly stiff and upright. They don't have sort of a, a graceful kind of look that I tend to like, but there's absolutely a place for hybrid teas in a garden like this. They, they, you know, they, they benefit from it as well. And they go very, very well. But again, if you have an upright type of hybrid tea like that, then what's my sort of relaxed kind of growth that I can contrast that growth habit of the hybrid tea with? And that begins to get us into that contrast, the shapes and things like that. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Now, we move on to texture. Okay, we've talked about this again, but I'm going to bring it up yet again, folks. Um, so you look at the lower left-hand photograph. We've seen that photo before. You see the texture. And again, you see the, the uh, dianthus, the, the, the slight pink flowers there with the, with the green, uh, with the gray foliage, the lamb's ears. And the one on the right is the one I really want you to focus on. So you see a rose in front, um, and then what you see behind it is bronze fennel. It's the feathery foliage of the bronze fennel. And I've talked a couple times about rose foliage kind of being consistent. Okay, and this is what's nice about this kind of feathery bronze fennel foliage. Bronze fennel and all fennels are actually a great home for beneficial insects over wintering too, by the way. Um, but think of, again, think of artemisia, um, any kind of feathery type plant 
and I like the way I think it just sets the shape of the rose off really nicely. That's why I like that. So that's texture. So texture is just as important in contrast as everything else that's in there. That makes sense. And I really like the look of that. Yeah, I like the plant a lot. It's kind of right now, mine are about six feet tall and covered with yellow flowers, but it's kind of, it's a really neat plant. So big butterfly magnet to uh, the fennels as well. So mm -hmm. we talk about contrast. What about the size of the flower? You remember I mentioned earlier, polyantha flower, drift series flower, the nitty gritty series. I mean, those series and the large blooms, there's contrast there. What about contrast and blooms in, in terms of the perennials themselves? On the left, you see uh, the yellow is Rutabecchia, uh, Black Eyed Susan. Um, Echinacea is on the right. Agastache, Blue Fortune in the back. Just perennials, but I've got a couple things going on here. The contrast in the flower shape of the Rutabecchia and the Echinacea against the Ag Agapanthus. The Agapanthus is upright, they're round. But now we talk about repeat, and this is something I want you to think about. People think, okay, I have to, I'm going to repeat Echinacea, for example. I'm just going to repeat Echinacea all the way through the entire garden. That could work, but maybe could you make it a little more interesting? Could you stretch your imagination a little bit? Okay, so look at the rutabecchia, which is the yellow, the echinacea, which is kind of the pinky purple. While they're different plants and different varieties of perennials, look at the similarities in those. That's what I want you to draw your eye to. How are they similar? Well, the bloom shape is relatively similar. They're round and the petals reflect down backward. They both have a button eye that's fairly prominent. They both are on upright stems. So now I'm beginning to open up my palette a little bit to repeating shapes that I want to do throughout the garden in order to tie the garden together, but not using the exact same plant over and over and over again. And even with an echinacea, you've got the pink here, there's white echinacea with the rutabecchia. There's different colors, different sizes. So think as you move through that as well. Those are some things to think about. The photograph on the right is the back is Penstem and Huskers Red. It's a bronze foliage penstemon, but all penstemons are going to have that upright shape. Again, I'm contrasting that with the flower of the rose, which is round, with an upright spiky kind of flower that's more delicate. I've got the grounded growth habit of the rose up against the spiky uh, sort of growth habit of the penstemon. Again, there is my contrast, but I'm getting it through bloom size right now. So how do you use them? How do you use perennials in the garden? We've talked about a couple of basic things. Repeating the perennials to sort of frame the ro our, our mad rose obsessive collection together. That's an important thing to do. We talked about that a little bit. Um, again, thrive in full sun. That's very, very important. Very in bloom time. Think about that. We're spoiled by roses by and large, unless you're an OGR person like me, um, that basically bloom from spring to fall for, for all of us in climates. Um, so that's kind of a thing. But perennials tend to cycle in and out. What I like to do is take a spreadsheet and I list my perennials, all the different ones that I have. And then I might list, you know, growth habit and size and width and things like that. And then I have four more columns, spring, summer, winter, fall, or however you wish to do that. Um, and then I will just basically block in when they bloom or when they have interest or something like that. Most of us, it's going to be spring, summer, fall. Three columns are probably enough. But that way you can make sure when you scan down that spreadsheet, your perennials, those three columns are not all in one column. So I have nothing but spring. And like I said at the beginning of this webcast, my goal is to have summer blooming perennials when my roses in my upper state South Carolina growth habit shut down a little bit. So I'm looking for that middle column to be my, my dominant column, but I still want, you know, different contrast and color in there. So taking the time to get that into a spreadsheet is going to be absolutely worth your while. Um, obviously, you know, recommended for your growing zone. That's a basic one. That's why we're not recommending specific plants. You know, if you're in zone four, you're going to be planting different than you're in zone nine. Um, so know what grows in your neck of the woods. Um, that's a real important stuff like that. Adequate space at their mature size. We love to cram in plants. That's not what you want to be doing. Know how big that plant is going to want to get and give it the room to get to what it wants to be. Okay. When you plant them around your roses, I'm going to recommend you make sure their mature size is at least to say at least, a, a, you know, maybe they can touch the rose a little bit. Don't let them get into the roses drip zone so they start competing for water and fertilizer and things like that. Just space your garden now. OK, so a couple designs tips I'm going to give you right now. You can buy software, whatever, graph paper and just vellum or some sort of transparent paper that you can trace on. You can't do better than that. One square equals one foot. Trace your bed out and start to make circles for your plants. If your plant's four feet across, 
it covers four circles across. If it's two feet across, it covers two circles across. You begin to dot out and kind of get your space going in that way and things like that. Now, this last one I'm going to give you is something that I've learned through trial and error over the last years of designing gardens. When it comes to perennials, don't think in terms of planting the same quantity of perennials in each and every block of perennials that you've done. And notice I'm using the plural perennials, not one plural. You never want to plant one perennial because that makes the garden look busy. You want to block three, four, five, six, seven. But think of it in terms of square footage that you want to cover with one variety of plant. I'm going to repeat that. Think of this in terms of square footage that you want to cover with that one variety of plant. What do I mean by that? I'm going to give you a rose illustration here, okay? Let's say I want to lay out a rose garden and I want all my blocks to be 12, sque 12 feet square. I'm just throwing out a, a, a varied number here, okay? And I'm going to fill block one with yellow ribbons ground cover rose, for example. That's a 24 inch diameter rose. As you can see by the illustration here I did in my landscape software, in order to fill a 12 by 12 foot planting area, I'm going to need 36 yellow ribbons ground cover rows. Flip it over, Belinda's Dream, shrub rows, four foot in diameter at least. I'm only going to need nine. So this is, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm focusing on the size of the planting area and then picking out the number of roses that I need to fill that planting area. Yellow ribbons, 36, Belinda's Dream, nine. So with perennials, again, use that graph paper, sketch out your space, all right? If you're planting lavender, which can maybe go to 20 to 24 inches on center, okay, then maybe you need six lavender to fill that space. And maybe each lavender covers two square feet, there's 12 square feet. Make your next block 12 square feet, okay? Now I'm going to plant dianthus in there, which barely covers a square foot. So maybe to cover 12 square feet, I need 12 dianthus. So 12 dianthus and six lavender both make 12 square feet. So I'm going to pause for a second, Diane, and see if it, any questions or anything, or can I make anything a little bit clearer about that? No, I think what you said makes sense, but I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, you know, for rose folks, we like to make sure that we've got some distance between our rose bushes because that nice air and the wind and the breeze can help to dry off the plants and help really to limit some diseases such as black spot in the garden. Do you find that you know, that you plan for that in your space as you were drawing out your diagram that you'd really give more space to the roses then? Or um, how does, does that potentially bring in more disease if you've got the rose bush crowded, I'll say, with other perennials? No, it's a great question. And, and so there's a couple ways I answer that. Um, number one is I go for roses that have natural disease resistance. Um, you know, to plant a garden like this, if, if you have a garden that, that, you know, there are some roses that, and they're gorgeous, they need to have some, they need spraying on a slightly more regular basis, might not be the best roses for this kind of garden. That's one thing to think about. Um, the okay. other thing is, yes, you want to make sure you do live some room. So if you've got, if this is your rose like this, for example, okay, and let's say this is my outer edge of my rose right here, I don't want a plant that's going to grow into here. You know, I want a plant that maybe gets within six inches of the rose or something like that. And the other mm -hmm. thing is that allows you to move through the garden and do your deadheading and do your maintenance and things along those lines. Well, and that's yeah, where you have adequate space and mature size. Know how big that plant's going to get, and more so in your climate, know how big it's going to get and leave the space. But yeah, you want to make sure you've got room. And that goes for the perennials too. They want space. They want to breathe. No plant wants to be choked. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, like to feed our roses. We know that roses do like a lot of food. Um, do you then you, uh, per use the, uh, provide the same amount of uh, fertilizers to your perennials as you do your roses? I do, yeah. Um, now, if you're using a granular fertilizer, you could certainly go through and use the, a, a specific, more rose-specific fertilizer for the roses themselves and then go to scatter out you know, the perennials. They're all going to be pretty consistent in terms of what they want. Um, but if mm -hmm. I use a foliar feed, like a seaweed or a fish-based foliar feed, everybody gets the exact same treatment. I tend to kind of treat them all as the same plant. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. All right, so now let's move on from this. So here is a little tip that I learned from someone. I don't remember exactly who. It's... And we see beautiful gardens all the time. You walk into gardens wherever, and they're gorgeous, and they're absolutely stunning, and all the colors are coming at you and things along those lines. But if you want to see, and I'm talking, remember, I'm talking about specifically a garden with companion plants. 
If you grow roses by themselves, that's a different kind of garden. That's okay. It's your garden, your choice. But specifically, if you want to see if your garden is starting to sing on all these different cylinders of contrast of color, contrast of texture, the things that we've been talking about, black and white photography is your friend. The iPhone, folks, you can or whatever phone you've got, you can take black and white photos like that. So this is my garden about six years ago when I was more rose-centric. Um, and I'm not saying it's not a beautiful garden. I, I love this garden when at the time when I had it. Not a lot of contrast going on. But if I convert that to black and white, and you can see what I was talking about. The roses are fairly harmonious in bloom shape, growth habit. Um, the little feathery thing you see a little bit of, that's actually um, 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 the green vegetable. Come on, what am I talking about? Mm, green asparagus? Like, it'll come. Asparagus, thank you very much. Hey, you're <laughs> so welcome. Roses and perennials, the vegetable part of my brain just switched off right there. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, but you can see it, and, and if you look in the black and white, I'm not saying it's, you know, again, I'm not saying that, that rose gardens by themselves are dull, but do you quite have the interest that you might have? So pop to the next photograph, Diane, and let's kind of show them what I'm talking about. So this is my same garden later on. Um, and now you can see in color again, you see all the different shapes and textures that I've got. If you look at it in black and white, now again, the, the, the bottom right hand, that's Napita, the blue on the left, and you can see it on the right. And now you can really begin to see how it begins to contrast. You know, even the tree rose, which is the red rose um, that's sort of in the top third of the photograph to the right a little bit, you see that. Um, sure. The white rose on the left, the big mounding rose is Garlo's Enigma. Look at how much they, how that kind of dominates that shape. But that shape mm -hmm. is set off by the asparagus feathery foliage just to the right of it. That's what mm -hmm. begins to make it pop. So this little, take a photograph in black and white, and if nothing else, throw in a bird bath, because that really helps. Um, and so basically, the, the, that this black and white photography really begins to help you look at your garden and say, oh, you know, I've got too much feathery going on over here. Let me kind of move things. Or maybe I need to put something to kind of break this, this repetition up a little bit. So this little black and white photography trip is a lot of fun. And I would encourage all of you out there right now, go out with your camera, your own garden. If you're in public gardens, wandering around, take some photographs, convert them to black and white. And just have a look at them and you'll begin to see how this begins to play against itself but this is a very inexpensive trick that's a fabulous way to begin to see and if you begin to see it going on this you begin to see all the different kind of things that are happening in your garden and this begins to really illustrate all the principles we've been talking about up till now i think this is a great uh tip and i actually tried this because you and i have been chatting about these slides for a bit now and uh, my front yard looks just boring. <laughs> so I can't wait to, to be able to spend a little more time uh, now after learning all these concepts and making it look far more appealing and interesting. Well, see, I've got one convert. My job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> if I get the president of the American Rose Society to agree to this, yes. <laughs> But I'm glad, Diane. I mean, I'm, I'm glad, and I'm also really, I want to thank the American Rose Society and you and, and everybody for allowing me to present something like this, because I know having been a member for 25 plus years and, and things like that, I know that, you know, this, this, you know, adding plant perennials to your roses has been a bit controversial from time to time. I think we're swinging into, you know, people wanting to do it more and more. But if you just use some basic tools and tips that we all have, that I hope we've given everybody today, um, you know, then you'll see that this is a really lovely way. And, uh, this photograph is uh, Coton Court in uh, the in, uh, United Kingdom. Um, just a an amazing garden designed by Christine Williams. And um, you can see everything. And this is a rose garden, by the way, folks. She calls it a rose labyrinth. But you can see the blue and the silver. You can see the spiky. You can see the spreading. You can see all kinds of wonderful things going on in this garden. It looks just absolutely stunning. And uh, yeah. Paul, yeah. I want to thank you as well. Um, you are a great partner to the American Rose Society. Uh, you've helped us in the design of our new garden, uh, which hopefully everyone will come to see in Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, if you're not a member now of the American Rose Society, I hope that people will consider joining us at rose.org. We have many member benefits and one of them is actually discounts on roses. And our partners here with Jackson and Perkins you actually offer 20% discount on roses for our American Rose Society members. So a great opportunity for all of us to partner and help each other to, to grow not only roses, but uh, beautiful gardens. 
Well, thank you, Diane. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, and, and I would put in a word for American Rose Society as well. I've been a member since, oh, over, well, over 25 years, probably 27 years now. Um, the magazine is a, is a great read. There's a lot of information. There's a great diversity of articles in the magazine. So that's worth joining the American Rose Society. And all gardening is local. So I would also encourage folks to seek out, seek out their local Rose Societies as well. You're going to find a wealth of experience in those local Rose Societies. Absolutely. We have over 200 Rose Societies across the country. And they will give you local advice because just like other perennials, there's different roses that grow better in various climates. Yeah. And again, all information is local when it comes to gardening. Yep. Thank you so much. And I look forward to our next chat uh, with our partners, Jackson and Perkins. Jackson and Perkins. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, for this wonderful webinar on companion plants. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure you put those in our questions pod. Uh, we do have a few questions uh, here already. Uh, and Paul, I have the first one for you. And it is, are there any perennials that harm roses when interplanted? It's a great question. Um, the answer is no, not really. Now, that being said, you want to stay away from anything that's going to be invasive. Um, some of the stuff that self seeds aggressively, for example, some of the stuff that runs, you want to stay away from that. But I've never really found anything that's going to hurt a rose. All right. I have another one here. This one I get asked every once in a while. Are there some roses which only bloom once a year? Is there a way to encourage additional blooming? Yes, the, the old European roses, um, old garden roses, you're talking gallicas, albas, centifolias, damasks, and I'm thinking I'm missing one class, I think, as well. They will they're spring flowering, by the way. I hate the expression once a year. It sounds like they're gonna bloom on one day and that's the end of it. Um they they bloom for a good three to four weeks. Um there's no way to encourage them to repeat bloom because that's in their DNA. They just don't do it. That being said, uh, as someone who loves these old roses, and I'm gonna make a case for them. There's nothing like a spring flowering old garden rose in full bloom, even a rose that repeats. You just you're just not going to get it. And and even if you go to the Gallicas, some of the purples that are in there are just absolutely stunning. And the fragrance on all of these is good. But that's where the companion planting comes in. So if you've got some old garden roses, and I, I grow quite a few of the old garden roses that, that are spring flowering, then you make sure they're surrounded by perennials that are going to bloom later on, perhaps in the summer or carry them on for that further. That becomes that, that layering of the gardening and timing that I talked about earlier in terms of spring, summer, fall interest moving through. But um, definitely get some of the uh, um, old garden roses. They are just, just beautiful. All right, I have another question for you. And I tell you, a lot of people wanna know the answer to this question, which is how do you control weeds in your rose garden? Uh, you go out and pull them. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> To be, you know, I mean, I, I use mulch. Uh, I do mulch for the, uh, the double ground or double hammered hardwood is the other expression that you use. The mulch helps keep them down. But I mean, you know, if, if a garden, you're going to be out there with weeds and pulling weeds. And, uh, you know, it's just it also, but it's also a nice way to kind of get close to the plants and see what's going on. I discover when I'm down on my hands and knees weeding, you know, sometimes a rose, I see some, maybe a cane has died back that I hadn't noticed. So I take advantage of that. But really, it's just, it, that's just the manual labor part of gardening. Absolutely. Are there any companion plants that you would be okay with roses in pots? No, that's a great question. Um, yes, I would go for things that are more shallow rooted. Um, herbs, for example, do really well. Uh, Took things that tumble over the sides. Um, annuals might be a good choice to go as well. The reason I say shallow rooted in a pot, you've got a limited amount of root space. And so you want to make sure that those perennials aren't going all the way down to the bottom of the pot and competing. So I would say lower growing things that sort of tumble over the sides of the pot, I think would do very, very well in a situation like that. All right. Uh, another one was, what do you put between plants so you get the uh, plants but not compress the soil? Say that again. Uh, it, the question was, what do you put between plants so you can get to the plants but not compress the soil? Oh, I see why you're walking through the plants. I see what you're saying. Um, I don't. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's the, 
I mean, if it was a major traffic pattern, I would probably do like a, like a, like some stepping stones or things like that. But as far as walking in the garden upon occasion, you know, when I need to do maintenance, I don't worry about it. You know, I'm not going to go out there after a soaking rainstorm when the ground is muddy and compress it that way. But I, I don't really worry too much about, you know, putting things down to as I move between the plants. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can find another one. Uh, I've got one here, John. Go. Like go ahead. Answer. It says, will spraying the roses damage the perennials? That's an excellent question. No, not really. Um, you know, I mean, the products you use on roses, be if you use fungicides and things like that, it's not going to harm your plants. Um, you know, but use the same thing, you know, try to spray early in the morning and then on a hot day when they can burn and stuff along those lines. But when you put companion, we talked about this as well. And then I also saw a question about watering and stuff along those lines. I don't treat my perennials any differently than I treat my roses. They all kind of get a consistent feeding. They all kind of get a consistent watering. It doesn't mean if it's really hot, I'm not out there with a hose, maybe occasionally if, I'm, if I get long between rainstorms, you know, touching the plants that are looking like they got a little stress going on. But I don't, I don't have a separate regime for the roses and a separate regime for the perennials when they're all together. I treat them all as, as basically as plants. All right. Uh, I have another one here. Uh, what's the best way to winterize roses? We live in zone 6A uh, or hardy to zone 5. Yeah, so um, I'm going to caveat this by saying that I've grown roses in Los Angeles, California, and now in the upstate of South Carolina, Zone 7. I'm not a cold weather expert. Um, you know, I, I'm not certainly not by experience. Um, first of all, buying roses for your zone is good. If you're six and you're buying roses hardy to Zone 5, I wouldn't think you'd have to winterize. Um, you know, Diane is actually probably more qualified to answer this question than I am, quite honestly. Um, I do know people who protect their roses. Uh, if you have roses in pots, people bring them into an unheated building like a garage or a shed or something along those lines. But try to find roses that basically can handle your zone. That would be my, my, my basic answer to that. But in zone six, I wouldn't think there's too many roses you'd have to winterize. No, this is Diane, and I would add um, some simple things you can do is to mound either soil or some mulch around the plant you know, as it starts to get colder, um, that will help protect those canes and the bud union if you have a grafted rose bush. Um, I don't use cones. I have over 200 roses in my garden. Uh, I do very simple protection. Sometimes I use uh, shredded leaves. I have a lot of oak leaves where I live and I'll just make simple paper collars, newspaper collars and put leaves in them. You're really trying to protect the plant from um, freezing and thawing cycles in the spring. That's where most of the damage can happen to your roses. And we will have another program yet uh, this fall on winterizing. So look for that program. I'm sure you'll get a lot of great tips. We already have uh, some programs on winter protection for roses on the American Rose Society YouTube site as well. Yeah, and if I could just make a, a little comment as well, I know there's some people probably in zones like five and maybe even zone four, and um, watch the Jackson Perkins website because I, as pe people know, I'm a consultant to them, independent consultant, and we are starting to bring in some of the uh, roses. Some of you are probably familiar with what's called the Canadian Explorer series, uh, John Cabot, William Baffin. Um, there's a whole bunch of new ones out now that have been bred to like zone three was out without any winter protection whatsoever. And we're starting to bring some of them into the United States uh, via the Jackson Perkins website. So keep an eye out for those too. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Paul. You know, I, I didn't mention, but I live in a zone five climate. So I'm, yeah. I do winter protect my roses. And by the way, snow is one of the best protectors uh, that, that you can find. But, but truly, if you take care of your rose bush throughout the, the season and it goes into winter healthy with great foliage, um, and you've got that bud union planted one to two inches below the soil line, you will most likely, in a, especially in a zone five and, and warmer, your roses will do okay throughout uh, the winter and they'll come back in the spring. Again, it's those freezing thawing cycles in uh, the March timeframe that really can start to damage our roses. But again, there's a lot of great material out there um, on, our, on our site as well as on the Jackson and Perkins site. And uh, you'll see more material. Uh, we're gonna have uh, a program yet this fall that talks specifically again about winterizing your roses. Great. 
I got a couple, John, here I want to jump in. There's kind of like two or three yeah. questions I want to sort of answer all together. I'm, see, I'm seeing one about uh, when do you deadhead the perennials um, and, and things along those lines. So let's talk about that just a little bit. Um, there was also one about pH. Uh, yes, uh, pH, you find you want to find plants that like the same pH as roses, by the way. So you might not plant like azaleas in with your roses. Um, but most perennials like that neutral pH. You'll be good that. Cutting back the perennials. I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, I cut back my perennials in the spring. Why? Because they're a winter condo for your beneficial insects. Remember, I talked in the uh, earlier about uh, the, the three triads for beneficial insects, food, water, shelter. Winter shelter is incredibly important. I'll give you a little example. I showed echinacea, uh, which is the, the cone flower is the other term that people use. They have a hollow stem and beneficial insects will literally burrow into that stem in the wintertime and that's where they hibernate, for lack of a better word. If I cut all that back in the fall and I chuck all that stuff out, then I'm basically throwing out all the beneficial insects that can be thick and gonna help deal with the insects like aphids and the pests that I don't want. Um, and so the answer, there was another question here, will companion plants bring pests to the roses like spider mites or thrips? No, they're going to bring the insects that you want, like ladybugs and hoverflies, you're going to deal with those. That's why also why I deadhead in the spring, because that's when I know that those insects are waking up and then I'll even some of those hollow stems, I'll leave them in the garden. So I know it's tempting to clean the garden up in the, in the wintertime. You're best off leaving it till the spring and just letting those beneficial insects because they'll be there ready to go to work when the pests show up on your roses in the spring. When I get aphids in the spring, I don't worry about it. Within three days, I've got just ladybugs, hoverflies taking care of it. So that's how you basically deal with the deadheading of the plants. Um, during the season, you can deadhead some perennials. Uh, Nepeta, for example, I will deadhead. It will repeat quite often if I do that. Um, just sort of figure out which ones do. But I tend to leave the seed heads and things like that, they're, they're, they're uh, winter food for birds. Um, so I do not tidy my garden in the wintertime. I do it all in the spring when I prune the roses. Thank you, Paul. I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, is there one that you would like to answer or uh, I can pick one for you here? If you want to pick one, that would be great. Um, all right. Yeah, I'm just looking back through here real quickly. Go ahead. Okay, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna try to find one that we have left. And it was about spacing that I saw. Uh, is there an approximate guideline for determining how many uh, rose plants would be ideal for a plot, for example, 80 foot by 40 foot wide while comp with companion plants? Yeah, I just saw that question. I just- Oh, I'm sorry, around. I saw that, I apologize. Uh, no, 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 I didn't answer it. I said I just saw it. I think it's a good yeah. question. I think it is. So here's the answer to that question. Um, the answer to how many roses is going to depend on how many companion plants, because all, every plant's going to occupy a certain amount of space. Square footage is probably the best way to go at it. Um, so let's say uh, you, uh, the question or later on goes, uh, for example, you say it can say a garden this size could comfortably hold about 100 rose bushes comfortably. How many would it hold when the garden becomes uh, with companion plants? So let's let's I'll see if I can kind of talk this through a little bit. So let's say we have 100 roses and each rose is three feet by three feet. OK, so that's nine square feet occupied by each individual rose by 100 roses. I've got 900 square feet of occupied space. I'm hoping that this this kind of makes sense here. So if I've got 100 roses in there occupying, you know, 900 square feet, nine square feet apiece. Let's say now I, I cut that back to 50. OK, so now I've got 50 roses at nine square feet. That's what, 450 square feet. And let's say my companion plants, because uh, I now have a 450 square, square feet left, left over out of a 900 square foot garden. Let's say I have companion plants that only cover one square feet. Well, I could put in 450 companion plants. I don't think I'd do that many. I'd want some spacing. So again, when I when I talked in the, the earlier when I talked about square footage, think of that. But each each plant's going to occupy a certain amount of space, and make sure each plant has that space. And I'll stop there, Diane and John, to see if you think, was that clear at all. Yes, I, I understood it, and thank you so yeah. much for the explanation. Yeah. So that and that's where again I talked earlier. Just you know, you can get some free software, or just get a giant sheet of graph paper and vellum. You know, each square equals one foot. So if you've got a rose that's three feet by three feet, it's going to occupy, you know, three squares in each direction from the center and make a circle and, you know, get just start making circles. 
and each circle should be the, the right size based on that one square equals one foot. And that's going to begin to tell you how it lays out. And that's going to give you the quantity of roses that you, and, and plants that you can get into that space. It's going to vary for every single garden. Right. Well, Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, Jackson and Perkins, for making this webinar available. Uh, we thank you for uh, coming here, uh, learning all about companion plants, and we hope you do join the American Rose Society so you can learn all about growing roses uh, and have a beautiful yard full of Jackson and Perkins roses. Diane? Yes, I too would like to thank Jackson and Perkins and Paul for today's session. This has, I think, been very informative and will help all of us with our gardens. And I know there were a couple of people that joined late, so I do want to mention that uh, this webinar will be posted on the American Rose Society YouTube channel, and I'm sure it will also be posted on the Jackson and Perkins uh, webinar programs as well. So you'll have plenty of access uh, to look back and to listen to this again and make sure that you capture all of these wonderful tips and techniques. Well, have a you. wonderful rest of your day and uh, your weekend and uh, look forward to hearing from you again soon. If we didn't answer your question, we'll make sure to get those answers out to you via email. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.